Happy Sabbath, everyone. So this is my last sermon preaching before I go on a holiday. Um, some people said amen. <laughs> um, so, um, and then, so next week, as we continue this Family Foundation series, um, uh, John Matthew, one of the elders from Hackney, will be preaching about um, children, mental health. Uh, John is a fantastic preacher. Please, please come and, and, and listen. And then the women's ministry leader from the conference will be looking at um, how much is too much. My sermon today, loving, difficult people. The challenge I have as a pastor is when I preach, sometimes you might see yourself in the frame. Please forgive me, I'm not preaching the conversations that we have had. Nor am I preaching in terms of my perception. I'm, I'm just trying to engage you um, as we explore that. Didn't Pastor Jesse preach a powerful message about spiritual purity, didn't he? I listened to the message on more than one occasion. And last week, Neil talked about the salvation model, right? Powerful message. Um, so, if you see yourself in my message, don't forgive me. Go straight to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Let me read the Bible text that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's, not, it's, it's more a topical sermon. Um, it's Colossians chapter 3. verses 12 and 13. I'm not going to be going into the text until the end of the sermon. Um, so Colossians chapter 3, 13, 12, 13. We'll read, we'll read right down to 17, really. Um, let's read together. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and clothe yourself with what? Compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and Verse 13, bear with each other and what? If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's go to verse 14. And over all these virtues, put on what? Which binds them all together in perfect. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your, since as members of one body we're called to what? And be... That, that was this week's lesson, isn't it? Let the message of Christ, what, dwell among you richly as you, what? Teach. Today I will not be preaching. I will be teaching you richly as you teach and what? With all wisdom through what? Psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit singing God with gratitude in your hearts. And finally, verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in words or deeds, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through. Father, may we give thanks at the end of this message. Amen. Amen. So, um, loving a difficult people. I want to start off by saying this morning that people are different. And that each of us, each of us, that each of us, we come with unique traits and characteristics. People are different. People are different. We have our own views of the world and our own concepts of reality. People are different. And we see things through different lenses, prisms. We look at life through different lenses. You see, many of us, we use differences to make us bitter rather than make us better. Are you with me? Uh, they can be used to show varieties or they can create chaos. Differences can create unpleasantness or they can make you attractive. Differences can make you stand out or they can make you unnoticed. 
Often those who are different learn to appreciate difficulties and they learn to show empathy more. Follow me carefully this morning. Thus, those who are different are more likely to provide a better support for those who are struggling through emotional pain. Differences can assist you in developing relationship in your own personal sphere. Being distinctive often allows you to leave a lasting impression on those you have met. Differences is a natural part of life. Did you hear that? An old preacher was talking to an old high school friend who drove an old rusty car and on that old rusty car was rather a snickel bumper sticker. It, it read, you are unique. And then a small font underneath it reads, just like everyone else. So here's the Bible text with me. Psalm 130. 139 14 please get your pens and write these thoughts down as I go along and challenge me if you will at the end of my sermon not doing my sermon um, the text says I will what I'll praise you for I am what fearfully and marvelous are thy and that my soul know it very well we are different Notice where I'm going with this morning. We are what? Different. Amidst our differences, the Bible says that you are what? You are fearfully made, you are wonderfully made, and you are marvelously made. So accept this reality. Now, now let, me, let me put this, this disclaimer out there for those um, alphabetical individuals. Um, I believe that sin has mess the game up, but I'm going to come to that. But I just want to put that disclaimer. When I'm talking about differences, a lot of people will, 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 will say, see, Pastor Smith is supporting a certain ideology. But by the way, I'm not going to be politically correct when I'm preaching the word. I'm not going to be hijacked by the liberal right. But let me go. So, so, so you are fearfully made. You are wonderfully made. You are marvelously made. In other words, um, you were made by the hand of God. Um, your, your DNA is very distinct. Very distinct. You have a distinct personality, a distinct identity, um, and each of us has the power to do and to think. Um, there's a text that reminds me of this. It says, yet, your Lord are, let you, Lord, are our what? Father, we are the what? You are the... We are all the work of your hands each of us each of us so 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 julian is different from me so his dna and my dna are different dna's and so and so if if a child is born and we're not certain of who the father is we do a talk to me we do a test and the test will tell you 99.999% who the Father is. So we are different. But here's what the servant of the Lord says. She says, it is the Lord's plan that there shall be what? Unity in diversity. Within the context of the Christian scripture I'm talking about here, the gospel differs, yet in them the record blends in one what? Talk to me, come on church. The Lord does not desire that our individuality should be what? The destroyed. We need to learn to celebrate the distinctness that comes with each individual. We need to learn to appreciate the differences that come with, 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 with each individual. And we must not be afraid to live, though we are different. The Bible stated, the Bible clearly states, that we were formed, we were, we were created, God created varieties. You could smell the sweet-scented harmony when God was finished with the world. The Creator understood that each thing that He created had a role and a function. Adam and Eve. Notice I said Adam and Eve. I said Adam and Eve. I'm, that's the difference I'm talking about. 
and all living things knew God, that God must be loved, respected, and worshipped. God was recognized as a sovereign being. There was no, at the end of creation, follow me, there was no conflict, order, or argument. Eve knew that Adam, Eve knew that Adam was her husband, and Adam knew that Eve was his wife. There was no issue with gender. And by the way, God is not confused. Can I say that again? God is not confused. There was no problem with gender, no problem with gender role, nor gender identity. God blessed man, and he called him man. God blessed woman, and he called her, he says, man, woman, woman, man. And they bloomed, they prospered, there was connection, there was companionship, they thrived. But something happened that distort life. I'm not preaching, I'm teaching this morning. Genesis chapter 1. Let's read together. So God created man in his own. In the image of God created him what? Male and? Right. If you come out of the Bible context, you can have all kinds of sort and all kinds of confusion. But notice what God did when he made man and woman. He Bless them. Come on. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Good. Good. But God made everything, young boys. It was good. I'm talking to the four boys sitting at the front here. I know their names. Right. So, right. Good. I know the four boys' names. They're smiling at me. Well, thank you for that. Right. So now we live in a world that is what? The world is conflicted. People are conflicted. Not only is that, but the world is also what? Complex. And now when you go on Facebook and TikTok, it says that relationships are what? Complicated. Not when God was finished. When God was finished, everything was what? But now relationships are complicated. So Pastor Smith, what happened? Let me go straight there. Sin has happened. Sin has created a foul smell in our lives, in our homes, in our communities, and in our relationships. Sin has happened. It has messed us up so badly. Our thinking, our living are so polluted by sin that we don't even understand what life is about anymore. Here's what, here's what Paul says. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, for all have what? Sinned and come short of the glory of, of God. Because of sin, my friends, we lack self-awareness. Are you with me? We lack what? I lack self-awareness. Because of sin, we struggle to maintain good relationships. Because of sin, we sometimes do not understand the difference between what is different and what is difficult. Are you with me so far? I'm going somewhere with this. We don't understand what is different and what is difficult. Now, Spurgeon made, Charles Spurgeon make, made a very powerful statement. He says that if Adam and Eve were, were easily deceived by the serpent and they lived in a world that was unbroken, in a world that was sinless, he says that it is easier for us to be deceived in a sinful world. Did you get that? Deception is lurking all around us. Yes, as church folk, we, we have come out of the world, but many of us are still in the world. Some of us are still controlled by the flesh. We are driven by carnal desire. We are consciously or unconsciously what Paul describes as Christians. We have forms of godliness, but we have no power. Christians, we're Christians, we're traveling to Canaan, but we're holding on to the things of Egypt. Come on with me now. We're fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah, 
but like Lot's wife, our hearts are still on the things that we have left behind. Or like David, we should be out there fighting the enemy. Instead, we're standing on the roof, gazing on the nakedness of the Bathshebas of this world. We live in the sphere of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is not living in us. Come on, talk to me, church. The Holy Spirit is around us, but he's not in us. We know about him, but does he know us? Can I make this point? And for that reason, we, many of us, we have a what? A f- read with me. We have a what? A false sense of, of church. So we come to church. A false sense of church. What do you mean by that? Uh, we look at church through the prism of heaven. Uh, we often forget that we still live in the land of sin. A land where we all try to do good, but the pull of sin causes us to do wrong. Many still, many still look at church through a rose-tinted glass. A place where life is rosy, laced with gold plates. It is a place where one drinks the metaphorically milk and honey. Let me say that people are attracted to church folks as a group of people, we are lovely and we are righteous. As a church, folks, they prey on our kind, caring, and forgiving attitude. Let me say this point here, that the church is a sitting duck for exploitation. Come on, talk to me. We are ripe for exploitation. Ah, we are ripe for exploitation. Uh, newsflash, many, many people come to church to use church as a vehicle to accomplish their evil deeds. The church is quiet. It's going to be a hard sermon. (laughs) Here, Here Paul, Paul says, sorry, Peter says, let's read, write it down. He says, be what? Be sober. Some of us are spiritually drunk. We're drinking too much. We don't drink alcohol, but we're drinking gossip. We're spiritually drunk. Be what? Come on, be sober, be what? Why? Because your walks about like a what? Seeking whom he may what? Devour. Listen, he's not talking about outside of the church. Peter is talking about inside of the church because Peter didn't like non-Jewish people. Read the, read the story. The Lord had to lick him, sorry, the, the Lord had to hit him down hard. In the church, there are those who come to church who have no desire to be a part of the church. But they're planted in the church by the evil one to destroy the church. Come on now, talk to me. So the Bible says that the wheat, be vigilant, and why? And sober because we have what? Wheat and? Tears. And tears. Be vigilant and sober because we have a sheep and? Be vigilant for, I'm so, sorry, vegetarian, there's nothing in the Bible. Yeah, we had the wheat and the tears, so that's for the vegetarians. And for those who eat fish, and I don't eat fish, um, for those who eat fish, I'm moving towards the, the, the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. But um, be sober and vigilant as the church have what we have, good fish and we have. And these were the words of Jesus. One of the scariest thing in church is to be ourselves. Only by God's grace And by the deep, intimate knowledge of his love and affection, can we find the courage to live out a broken and vulnerable life. To be the person God wants us to be, we must abide with Christ in our thoughts, in our emotions, in our desires, and in our speech. We must develop a greater sense of self-awareness. So, when I become self-aware that the church... It's not a gold-plated place. 
A greater sense of self-awareness leads to a what? A greater God awareness. A greater God awareness leads to what? A greater what? Self-awareness. And a greater self-awareness leads to more what? Satisfying Christian life. If you don't understand yourself, if I don't understand myself, if I don't understand that I need to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, if I don't understand that I must be seasoned with the presence of the Holy Spirit, that my conversation must be guided by the power of God, if I don't understand that just merely dressing up and coming to church is a form, and that what God requires of me as a child of God is that internal transformation. Can I talk to the church this morning? What I need in my life is for God to wash me now, without and what? Within. Too many of us are pretenders. We, we come to church, we pretend. Our spirituality doesn't touch severely our deep internal wounds and, and sin patterns. Um, we are one face in church at work and another face at home. God help me this morning. I have a problem. I, I have a problem with the truth. So I, I hide the truth. The truth it's too painful for some of us. And so we, we have a facade. It's safer to live that way. But here's what Jesus says. Read with me. You will what? You will know the truth and the truth will what? But many of us, we are contented in living as a prisoner. Because an image looks better than the truth. But I want, listen to me this morning, I want God to break me out of the prison of an image so that the truth of God can hit me so hard that I prostrate before him and says, Lord, have thine own way in my life. I've been thinking about me and how I relate to people. And generally, what I've discovered, that the things that I see in people are often not them. It's me. The church is quiet as a, I can hear the Holy Spirit moving in this place. Watch an individual who keeps picking on you on, on a particular situation. Huh? The saying goes, if, if, if he's saying you're cheating, check him out. Always, no matter what you do. If she's saying that you're the cheater, you need to check. We tend to look at people through our own sinful eyes. So, I can be a good pastor, but a bad husband. I can lead a church. I can lead many souls to Christ, but yet still, Christ is not in me. You can be a model of members of the church board, but you're unteachable. Nobody can speak to you. You can be a good student of the Word, but the Word is not in you. You're mean, unkind, cold, uncouth. You can be a good prayer warrior, but a professional gossiper. And let me stick a point here. Some people use prayer meeting to gossip about others. Can, I, can we stop and pray for Sister Brown? Sister Brown is having a relationship problem. Can we stop and pray for Brother Brown? Brother Brown has been struggling with this for a long time. Some of us use prayer meeting as moments to gossip. We can fast weekly 
and yet still be the most critical member in the church. Hey, church should be a place where we meet God. Our church, this church, God's church, must be filled with the presence and with the power of the Holy Ghost. God must be the abiding force where light and life, the presence of God, must mean much to all of us. Listen, so when we come to church, let us come to church knowing that I'm coming with myself, but as I'm traveling, I'm traveling with the presence and with the power of the Holy Ghost. The challenge is, as we seek to come with the presence and the power of God, we are confronted with difficult people. I, I, I struggle with this text. I, I, I personally struggle with this text. I don't know about you. I really struggle because I don't know what Paul is telling me. Read with me. Therefore, if thine enemy what? What should I do? My feed my enemy? If he thirst, give him what? What? Let, let, let him let, let him thirst. Let him dehydrate. For in so doing thou shalt what? Heap what? How can I, as a child of God, I'm talking about loving, living with difficult people. How can I, as a child, how can I? Treat those who undermine me and demean me with love and respect. Why should I do that? As a child of God, my moral compass, listen to me this morning, must be different from those who lack God's presence and those who lack God's power. I must become a part of the solution rather than part of the drama. We must not be blinded by addiction, grudges, or sinfulness. We must, we must learn, listen to me this morning, we must learn to place boundaries around the behavior of others. You didn't hear me this morning. We must learn to place boundaries around evil behaviors and don't let their problem become your focus. One of the most difficult person to deal with in a church is a narcissist. You know who a narcissist is? <laughs> research has shown that narcissists love to come to church. And that church, churches are full of narcissistic people. I don't mean this is what the research has shown. You go read it. Now, they, narcissists come to church because they can hide. It's easy to hide as a narcissist. They come to church because they can discredit their victims easily using prayer and testimonies. They can come to church because they like to be praised and they like power. Now, research has shown that actually a lot of leaders have narcissistic tendencies. Pray for me as a pastor. I need your help. So when we talk about narcissistic individual, and these are people who are coming to church now, uh, here are some words that describe them. They're, they like power. They, they like attention. They manipulate. They, admire, they like admiration. They're entitled. They, they like to be the center of attention. They like control, and they lack empathy. So let me demonstrate quickly. Let me demonstrate, let me demonstrate, let me demonstrate. I was going to use my wife, but I probably won't need to do that. So narcissistic people, they have a method, a method, they have a way of getting under your skin. Right, now I didn't know these things before. Uh, come Sonia, come on, come on, come on, come on. You look at me and I look at you. Come on, so we looked at each other. So let me tell you about narcissistic people. Right? So, so, and this is about how they, first they love bomb you. 
They, 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 the bombing is done to keep your attention focused on them. So what they do, they, they, they give you excessive gifts initially. They, they compliment. You're looking so wonderful today. And, and they cling to you, and, and they try to get you away. <laughs> She's playing too well. They try to get you away um, uh, um, from, from, from everybody else. I'm talking to you young ladies now. They, they separate you from your friends. Uh, and they want your attention 24-7. And, and, and they want you to make quick very quick commitment to them. They love bomb you. They buy you expensive gifts. They, 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 they grab you. They hold you. And when, when they start to do crazy things, when they start to do crazy things and, and you're, you're coming to your senses, you recognize that your life is in danger, they start to Gaslight you. It's in your head. Uh, they trivialize your emotions. They, they question your memory. What you have read um, actually never happened. Um, it's just a figment of your imagination. And, and when you decide you're going to be walking away, they start to hoover you, suck you back in. They start to send you uh, uh, fake remorse. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cheat. I'm, oh my goodness. Um, it has nothing, you were not giving me attention. Um, the future faking you. In the future, I'm going to do the best that I can do. And they start offering you romantic gestures and, and grand gest and grand gest. You know, I love you. My, you know, there's nobody else like you. <laughs> they... Start hoovering you. Pastor Jesse said, thank you, sisters. Pastor Jesse said last week, last week in his sermon, in his sermon, when you find yourself challenged with spiritual purity, you must what? Run. When a narcissist comes your way, If you find yourself in the company of a narcissist, you need to tread softly as a child of God and circumspectly. If your spouse, if you're married to a narcissist, I'm going to have to pray for you because you're in deep trouble. If you're in a relationship with a narcissist, not yet marry, take your shoes and run. Because when a narcissist looks in the mirror, all he sees, all she sees is her self. Here's how the Bible describes a narcissist. We have them in the church because this is, this is, this is Jude talking about the challenge. He says, warn to them, for they have what? They have gone in the way of what? Cain and what? Ran greedily after what? The errors of what? Cain. Cain was jealous for his brother, and so he did what? He murdered him. Uh, uh, Balaam was selling his soul to the devil for money, to, for reward and what? Perish in the gain, saying of what? Of core. Let's go. These are what? Spots in your what? In your feast. Read with me. Uh, feeding themselves without what? Fear what? Cloud they are without what? Carried about of winds, trees without what? Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. By the root. Come on now. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. If you're under the spell of a narcissist, your mental, emotional health is in trouble. They're feeding off you. The relationship is very malfunctioning. Your joy will diminish. They will put you down. They'll abuse you. They'll exploit you. You will lose your personality. You will lose your purpose. If you're a man, they'll emasc emasculate you. If you're a woman, they'll defeminate you. You are weakened. Your personality is destroyed. You don't know yourself anymore. Your spiritual connection with God becomes weak. Pastor, how do I love a narcissist if they're in the church? I'm glad you asked. 
How should you love a narcissist? You should what? You should what? Run. The Bible says, let's so. He that walketh with what? Wise men shall be what? But a companion of fools shall be what? Run. Run. Don't, don't, don't. Next, when you run, run and pray. Luke, Luke says what? Bless them that what? And pray for them which what? Despitefully use you. And then he says what? Encourage. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh to them that are of what? A broken heart and save it such as be of a broken spirit. Help from a distance. Get him or her to seek help. And nobody says amen. amen. That's okay. My, my, my sermon is not finished, but my slide is finished. And then we have in church what we call the negative Nancys. Give me another 10 minutes and then I'm done. The negative Nancys and the Dave Downers. The who? The negative Nancys and the Dave Downers. The negative Nancys and the Dave Downers. Let me tell you about the negative Nancys in church. They'll tell you it will never work. The negative Nancys will tell you um, we have done it before. They will tell you we are fine without it. They will tell you we can't afford it. They'll tell you we're not ready for it. They'll tell you it's not our responsibility. But listen to what Galatians chapter 6 says. Brethren, when we're dealing with the negative people in the church and in our lives, this is what the Bible says, Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Listen, here we go, here we go, here we go. Learn to be humble. Be constant in prayer. Seek wise counsel. Be factful in the presence of negative people. Caution is the buzzword. You see, because negative people are very toxic. And toxicity, tox, you know the word, Breeds, talks. Remember Jesus' method when dealing with negative people. The more time you spend in the company of negative people is the negative you yourself will become. But can I have a word of caution here to some of you, some of us? Before you, before you start taking the beam out of the eyes of the negative person, make sure that there's no plank in your eyes. Come on, church. We need to learn. Michelle Obama says, when they go low, you go what? High. Never stoop to the level of those who are negative people. Remember that you're a child of God. You are a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You were baptized. You were washed. You are filled with the power and the presence of God. And so you need to learn to let go. Now, if I had time, I would talk about those who like to show off. And those who like to boss people around. You see, the show-off like to impress you. They like name-dropping and, and relishing, comparing on the surface. They seem cool. They may seem superior. They may seem as if they're okay. But I've learned that those who enjoy showing off have an insecurity complex. And they have an identity syndrome. Internally, internally, their life is in turmoil. And so the only way to make themselves look good is to make you look bad. They're attention seekers. But, 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 but can, I, can I say, how do I deal with those people as a child of God? Do not be like them. Choose your words carefully. The Bible says, let your conversation be seasoned with what? With salt and with grace. Choose your words carefully. Don't embarrass them. Resist the temptation of competing with them. When we deal with difficult people, our natural reaction is to try to change them. The problem, my friend, 
as I close, is not to change them. Because you can't change a difficult person. The only person that you can change is yourself. You see, you, you, you thought I was talking about the narcissistic people in the church. You thought I was talking about those who were showing off in the church. I'm talking about you and I. The only person who can change you and I is Jesus Christ. Oh, the Bible says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace. Remember the story of David. He was dealing with a difficult Saul. Remember the story? God anointed him. I'm done now. God anointed him. God appointed him. But Saul kept chasing him. And what did David do? David keep running into the arms of the Almighty God. When the difficult person is chasing you, you run into the arms of the Almighty God. There you'll find hope and love and there you'll find protection. Remember the story of the, the Hebrew boys whilst they were down in Babylon. They were faced with difficult people. What did they do when the king, the king was talking? He says, oh king, we're not, we are not careful in answering thee, but the God whom we serve, he will what? He will protect us. What about Daniel? What he did? They kept bothering him, but Daniel spent his time on his knees. And even though he went down in the lion's den, God lifted him up. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? How did he treat difficult people? He loved them. He, he nurtured them. Let me, let me close with a story. I, I used to pastor a church. I won't tell the church. And I had a very difficult person. They're, they're, they're always undermining me. They would say unkind things about me. Most of what they said was not truthful. As the pastor for the church, I had the power. You know, pastors, we have power. We can undermine them. I could preach from the pulpit about them. And I was tempted. I was tempted to do that. Because everything I did, they stood in my way. And every time I tried to move the church in a certain direction, they tried to block that pathway. I knew what God was telling me to do. But this difficult person stood like a rock. And they had power in the church. They were loved. And so whatever they said, the members believed. So I was placed in a compromising position. I had a choice, write the conference and say, move me, or I could stay and fight. But then the Lord gave me a word. The Lord said to me, Sister Sharon, the Lord said, Pastor, said, Royston, the reason why you're here is to save you. This difficult person was placed here to change you. Amen. There are things about your life that I need to work on. I'm using this person as a conduit to transform and to change your life. I said, Lord, you're lying. I can't sleep. I'm having restless nights. I'm losing weight, Lord. It's not true. The Lord says, be quiet. I'm working on you. I'm transforming you. I'm, I'm changing you. I want to make you a better person. So stop complaining about the person. Stop praying that God should change them. Start praying that God should change you. And I changed my prayer. I says, Lord, change me. Make me a better pastor. And do you know when I left, when I left the church, when I left the church and the new pastor went, a letter was written to the conference. Um, we have lost our best pastor. 
we need, we need him back. When I left, a letter was written because when they were ill, I was the first person to go into that room and pray with them. It's not about me. It's about God. How do you deal with a difficult person? Change your ways. Change your life. You'll be surprised. I'm not saying take abuse. I want to put that in. I did say run, did I not? But what I'm saying is, sometimes when you change your ways, when you change your own life, you recognize that maybe the problem is not them. Maybe the problem is me.